Good morning, everyone. And good morning to everyone on Zoom and and everybody that will be joining us later. We're so happy that you're able to be with us. And a special happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you. And not only is it the day of wearing of the green, look at all nature, is having a happy St. Patrick's Day. So uh, we want to welcome you. And now please, uh, let's try to still our hearts. I couldn't find my glasses this morning, so I was late getting here. And I know my heart's still sort of pounding, like, you know, <laughs> trying to fly fast enough without getting caught, that kind of thing. So anyway, we have to that all aside and remember we're here to worship the Lord and to learn from him. Our, um, I have some sad news for you that our pastor is ill. Uh, he has COVID, so let's be sure to pray for him and uh, hope that he recovers quickly. And we're fortunate that Sam Wade is going to be um, giving us the message this morning. Please join me responsibly in the call to worship. We come to worship with joy, trusting God's holy word will inspire us. May God hear our praise. May we be counted among those who love and honor you and all our being. And our opening prayer, dear Lord, please hear our prayer. Holy God, your willing grace astonishes us when we consider what we as human beings have done to each other, to your creatures, and to this beautiful earth. Each of us has the seeds of destructiveness within us. Yet we struggle with hard feelings when it comes our turn to forgive others. Soften the soil of our hearts with the spring rain of your grace. Prepare us to be merciful as you are merciful. For we ask this in the name of Christ, your mercy poured upon us, amen. Today, um, we're doing something a little bit different for our prayer confession. Instead of reading responsibly, we're going to sing together. We're going to be singing, forgive our sins as we forgive on page 444 but to the tune of Amazing Grace. So I wanted to tell you ahead of time so we can actually be confessing, not frantically looking for page 444. Oh, great. <laughs> or frantically looking at the screen. Okay. So, Lord, here it says, I will give the call to confession, and then we will sing. Let us approach God with our confession, trusting that even before we speak, God knows us and loves us. Let us take a moment for silent confession. Jesus walked on the earth and knows the temptations that lead us away from God. His gift of healing extends even to our transgressions. His life shows us the transforming power of God's mercy in a world of hurt and pain. His ceaseless love and grace assures us of our forgiveness. Brothers and sisters, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now, in just a moment, we're going to um, pass this peace that Christ has given us. And if you're visiting or new or wondering why we wave our hands apart, it's during the COVID pandemic when we weren't supposed to be projecting our voices, we use the universal sign language to say, you know, the peace of God be with you. So we continue to do that. And you can say peace, whatever you want to say, but... Uh, there really is a meaning to why we're doing this. <laughs> and now we're blessed by some music with the florist. Good 
Good morning. In a few moments, I'm going to sing Make Me a Channel of, of Your Peace. In preparing to sing this song, I did some reflection so I could hear it with fresh ears. And now that I have hearing aids, it's even more important. I want to share some of my reflections with you so maybe you can hear it with fresh ears as well. Alvina Louise Flory. My mom, Alvina, reflects this song. This song, which originally was attributed to St. Francis as his prayer of peace. And as many of you know, mom recently crossed over to glory on February 18th, Debbie's birthday. And now it's also mom's birthday into heaven. Make me a channel of your peace. Peace often means absence of conflict, but peace here is more like shalom. May you have wholeness in your life, wholeness of well-being, health, and prosperity. Mom had a deeper inner joy as a result of her peace. As a kid, I learned that we receive joy when we know it's three letters in the proper order. Jesus first for J, O others second, and third, your Y, yourself last. And that's consistent with St. Francis as well. J for Jesus. Make me a channel of Jesus' shalom. May I be a channel or conduit to bring Jesus' spirit to all. I want love to replace hatred, forgiveness, which we've heard a lot about, to go where there's injury, whether it's of feelings or injury physically, and light for darkness. The second and third letters, O and Y, for others first and then yourself. And the chorus of this song reflects this. Seek not for me to be consoled, but for me to console others. Not for, seek not for me to be understood, but for me to understand others. And seek not for me to be loved, but to love others and to do it with my whole soul. Mom Alvina reflected this joy in her spirit and like for St. Francis, she practiced it. Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Debbie and I invite you to join the celebration of Elvina's life on April 6th at 2 o'clock here at the church. This is Saturday after Easter. In the meantime, I dedicate this song to Elvina and her ability to reflect joy in the best tradition of St. Francis. And give me a second to take it. Time is here. Make me a channel of shalom where there. Hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. And where there's doubt, true faith in you. Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. 
To be loved as to love with all my soul. <clears throat> Make me a channel of shalom. Where there's despair in life, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, only light. And where there's sadness, ever joy. Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love with all my soul. Make me a channel of shalom. It isn't forgiving that we're forgiven. In giving of ourselves that we receive. And in dying that we're born to eternal life. And in dying, like you, Mama, that we're born to eternal life. Thank you, John. And as our tradition in this church, our music is a prayer to God. So, amen, and let it be so. Our prayer for illumination. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And as I explained, our pastor is ill, and Sam is going to be uh, giving us the devotional words today. And our scripture reading is from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. And it uh, starts on page 974 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to read along. Actually, it starts on page 975. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. 
But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I had canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Man, I'd missed the part about being tortured before when I read this parable. (laughs) Okay, welcome, Sam. So when I found out that Bonnie was going to be the literatist, it calmed my nerves. Whenever she speaks, I just feel so happy inside. You know, the Lord is with you. So great, Bonnie. I'm so thankful that you're here. Um, I got a phone call from Mark yesterday in the afternoon, and his voice sounded like caca. And he said, Sam, you have such a sympathetic way about you. Would you please speak? I said, speak where? <laughs> At the church. Oh, and, and you mean the liturgy? No, the sermon. And I'm thinking to myself, one of the things that attracted me to this church was that there's this back bench of retired preachers in attendance. Why didn't you call one of them? And then I was thinking to myself, Mark, you don't realize that my happy place is in front of a slot machine with maybe a glass of Crown Royal. (laughs) And then, you know, when he was talking about the parable of the unmerciful servant and forgiveness, and I'm estranged from one of my siblings, and I just went, you got the wrong guy. Um, I'm estranged not because I don't forgive. I'm estranged because it's so painful to be around her. She hurts me. And I've told her that I love her, but I just will not be abused. It's kind of like Charlie Brown and Lucy where she holds the football I won't pull it away, I swear. And every time it gets pulled away. But the parable isn't necessarily talking about that. You know, seven. As a gambler, seven's a good number. Seven seas, seven colors of the rainbow, seven days of the week, seven loaves, seven baskets. Um, And Peter... Peter, it's ironic that Peter, he's, he's low-balling Jesus. He looks at him and goes, seven times? He's the one that's going to be needing forgiveness. He's going to fail Jesus. And yet, Jesus responds not with a number because he's taking forgiveness out of the numberness category. He's putting it into incalculable. And he's also kind of reminding Peter that you can't do it alone. You need me with you. So I'm going to ask you two questions. We're not going to answer them right now. But the first question is, what keeps us from offering compassion and mercy to others when we we have received so much. I don't know about you, but I've been blessed. 
less so much? And how might we become as aware of our own capacity to sin against others as we are of the capacities of others to sin against us? Trust me, when somebody does me wrong, I let Jenny know about it. <laughs> but how many times have I sinned against others and didn't even realize it? Didn't have a clue. It just went over my head. I also thought about that parable. In another life, um, I worked in policing, and the countless victims that I would encounter who suffered trauma and injury, how do you as a rape victim forgive your rapist? Some of the sins that we encounter are almost impossible to forgive. And I think that's what the parable is also talking about. It is impossible for us to forgive on our own. The night before Jesus died, he knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew that Peter and the other disciples would abandon him. And this is what Jesus said. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I've heard that many times, many times. But in prepping to speak to you today, what that says to me is unconditional love. He knew exactly what was going to happen, and he's telling them, you're forgiven anyway. Know it well. Love is the meaning. Who reveals this to you? Love. What does he reveal? Love. Remain in this and you will know more of the same. That was written many years ago by Lady Julian of Norway, Norwich, also known as Lady Julian, Dame Julian, or Mother Julian. She lived between 1343 and 1416. Her writings are the earliest English version surviving works of a woman. The works are the revelations of divine love. Lady Julian survived the Black Death between 1348 and 1350. We survived something similarly between 2020 and 2022. She survived revolts, trauma. She was close to death on her deathbed and had visions, visions of the passion of the Christ. She survived her near-death experience, and she wrote down what she saw. It wouldn't be until 1670 that her writings were first published, then rediscovered in the 1800s, and I think last studied around 1901. They are also the only surviving English language works by an anchoress. So you may ask, what is an anchoress? An anchoress is like a hermit, um, someone who shies away from human contact in order to have a deeper spiritual contemplative life with God. She was also described as a mystic. A mystic in Christianity is defined as becoming one with God or the absolute, but it could also refer to any kind of ecstasy or altered state of consciousness which is given a religious or spiritual meaning. In the Eastern Church, mysticism is much glorified, not so much in the Western Church. It properly means shutting your eyes and your mouth and experiencing the mystery or being contemplative. There is a small minority movement in our Christian faith of contemplatives. Um, 
that embrace not only Jesus and the Trinity, but the deeper understanding through that can only be discovered through contemplation. So in the New Testament, mysticism's meaning is categorized as the counsels of God once hidden, but now revealed in the gospel. So we're still talking about the good news, folks. Forgiveness is about love, and love is about everything. Scripture describes God in one of four ways. Spirit, light, fire, and love. Scripture teaches us that we are made in God's image, which means that we are made in love, from love, for love, with love. Call me crazy. Jenny does every day. (laughs) But I think love is the hidden DNA of the universe. It's the energy exchanged without requiring payment in return, and it happens every day. So John led us off on a Franciscan journey today, and I'll follow suit, and we'll talk a little bit about Christian, a Christian Franciscan, and Franciscans are a bit on the mystical side. Out of all of the um, denominations in Western Christianity, they have a little bit of Francis and Claire still residing in them. Today's Pope, even though he was raised a Jesuit, he's at heart, he's a Franciscan. That's why you took Francis of Assisi's name. But I'm thinking of another Franciscan, a Father Richard Rohr. And Father Rohr is still alive. Um, One of the nuns at his seminary made the comment that Father Rohr has never had a thought that he hasn't written down. (laughs) He's written many books. But this is what he wrote. God uses the mistakes of the past to create a positive future, a future of redemption instead of retribution. God doesn't eliminate or punish the mistakes. God uses them for transformative purposes. Think restorative justice. Folks making amends and changing themselves versus a punitive or retribution or punishment style of justice. And that's what our criminal justice system is today. Father Rohr continues, people formed by such love are indestructible. Forgiveness is the very best description of what God's goodness engenders in humanity. I agree with those words. Um, To me and others, forgiveness is about transformation. Forgiveness is changing at your core. It's not necessarily about behavior. If it was about obedience um, and cleaning up your act, that wouldn't cut it. But love and forgiveness is also about discovery and growth, which takes discernment and not enforcement. It requires you to do what Jesus did, to go off and meditate. Throughout scripture, it shows where Jesus, before he talks to the disciples or anyone, He goes off by himself and he meditates. So, those first two questions. What keeps us from offering compassion and mercy to others when we have received so much? That's your homework today. 
How might we become as aware of our own capacity to sin against others as we are of the capacity of others to sin against us? I am hoping that it's through prayer and contemplation and, most importantly, with the help of the man upstairs. I'm ready for you, Kathy. I'm one of those multitude of retired pastors. I got here first. That's the reason you didn't get asked. <laughs> I invite you now to um, say with me our affirmation of faith. It comes from Colossians. Um, thank you. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we will clothe ourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We will hear with each other and forgive of one another as the Lord has forgiven us. I invite you to sing with me um, our, our hymn. Um, it's called the summons, but most of us just call it, Will You Come and Follow Me If I But Call Your Name? What was your charge to the people? That they go out and with open arms and open eyes to forgive? Ooh, that's a toughie. But take with you this blessing. The God who created you and loves you will be with you. The Jesus that taught you how to love will be in you. And the spirit that fills you up will nudge you when you need to be nudged. So go in peace and may the God of peace go with you. Amen. Amen.